Okay, thank you for uh, coming back after lunch. We, uh, uh, this is kind of part two of what we uh, had begun uh, this morning on the Second Vatican Council of the Year of Faith. So uh, this morning we looked uh, towards the council, we looked at what preceded it, we looked at some of the things the council itself had to say, and then we looked at some of the ways in which the council had been interpreted over the last 50 years. Uh, our session this afternoon is uh, a continuation of that. It's about the Second Vatican Council and uh, faith and evangelization today and for the next 50 years, or at least for the next uh, year of faith. Uh, like the first session, there is a uh, handout you can use to follow along with. It's on the back side of the one that we had this morning, so we invite you to follow along there. Okay, and so for this session, there's three parts to the talk. The first part we want to focus on a personal faith. Tell me about Jesus. Um, and that's coming from Chris's talk this morning from the Vatican City Council. A more personal faith. And then the second part will be focused on the characteristics of the year of faith. Really coming from what Pope Benedict has, has written in Porta Fide, the door of faith. And then thirdly, a personal faith and the new evangelization. How does this personal faith really, how are we called to spread the faith in this, um, in the year of faith? Alright, so let's uh, begin at the beginning. Number one, a personal faith. Tell me about Jesus. Uh, I was a student at the Liturgical Institute, which is uh, on the north side of Chicago at Mundelein. Uh, and as a student, I got to know a fellow student, this uh, uh, priest right here, Father Tony Vico, who is a priest of the diocese, I think it's just a diocese, of Newark, uh, New Jersey. And uh, Father Vico uh, was also a spiritual director, as he was, while he was there as a student, offer spiritual direction to the seminarians. And, you know, it's just a, a good presence to have around. And one day at lunch, uh, after everyone else had left, it was just the two of us, he says to me, he says, you know, I, I love being here on the seminary, on uh, the seminary campus. And I love uh, being with these guys. And uh, occasionally at, at lunch, kind of like this, uh, when it's just me and another seminary, I'll look at one of them and I'll say, and I'll look right in the eye and I'll say, tell me about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. And he says, these seminarians, you know, they kind of him and haw and squirm a little bit. And I'll say, well, you, know, you know, Jesus, he's the second person of the Trinity and... Uh, you know, the Council of Nicaea in uh, oh, you know, 325 said he was uh, 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 consubstantial. And then Father Puico said, no, 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 no. Tell me about Jesus. Don't tell me facts about Jesus, information about Jesus, theories about Jesus, Jesus, dogmas about Jesus. Tell me how you have a personal relationship with the person of Jesus himself. Tell me about Jesus. And the whole time when he's uh, telling me this, I'm thinking to myself, not uh, all these seminarians, and figures that's something they would, you know, I'm thinking, my God, I hope he doesn't ask me this question. <laughs> because like those seminarians, I would have hemmed and hawed and done the rest because I know a lot about Jesus. You know, I know all, you know, I know the things that the, the councils have taught about him. I know the various heresies that have cropped up about the, 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 the one divine person in two natures, etc. I know a lot, I got a lot of book learning about Jesus, but that is not, that is not the same thing as knowing Jesus. And this is what Father Tony Nico was trying to get the seminarians, me, and hopefully today all of us to understand. He really embodies these purposes, these goals of the Second Vatican Council, to have the deposit of faith, but invigorate it, make it come to life, let it change your life, let it cease to be something in your head, and make it something transformative. Okay, so now please don't misunderstand us that we're saying, well, throw out the text, throw out the catechism. No, we have to learn the faith, but it's more than this academic intelligentsia or something. It's, it's we have to pray and, and encounter Christ in the truths, the teachings, and then develop this deep personal relationship with him. And makes a great point. When we say uh, the, a personal Jesus, we don't mean a Jesus after our own making, because Jesus is the objective reality, the truth, the ground of all being. And so again, don't take from that that you know a personal Jesus is one that we create. He is objectively true. We need to come to know him. We need to do so in a personal way, a personal way. Now, we think this is a lot of the impetus of this has come from the Second Vatican Council. 
and even from a certain way of thinking that preceded the council. And there's a number of ways that we can come to understanding this. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm a philosophy major, you know, a liberal arts major. Anybody else here a liberal arts major? Uh, yeah, what's the, that joke about? What's the most uh, commonly heard question on the job side of a liberal arts major? You want fries with that? You want cream with the, your coffee or something like that? This is not to put down people who sell fries and things, but the point being the liberal arts majors uh, generally are not the type that are going to go out and make millions of dollars. So when I get a chance to use my uh, whatever philosophy training I have, you know, I try to jump upon that. So this is just one way to come to understanding this idea of this personal approach. In philosophy, there's this thing called personalism, which is a school of thought that approaches reality through one's individual, on the ground, incarnate, everyday, lived experience. Right? Sometimes when we think of philosophers, we think they're far out, they speak a different language, they're in another world. That ain't personalism. Personalism speaks with the things that are around us every single day, the things that we experience. Now, just a little bit of a, a background. The guy that uh, is called the father of personalism, or this school, is a fellow named Edmund Husserl. And he was a, he was a, math, uh, he was a, a mathematician originally. He got tired of all the skepticism and philosophy. He wanted kind of the, the black and white uh, like math is. So he invented this school, or developed this school, that describes things as they, as they are in the world. In fact, it said that he had a graduate student once who, whose assignment was for an entire semester to describe a mailbox. You think you had a boring uh, philosophy class once upon a time, let me tell you. But anyway, it, the point of it still is, is that you know, we start with the things in the world, not in some abstract, transcendent realm, but with reality. Now, this fellow Husserl had two famous students, and they came to him both in the same year, 19... I can't quite remember. Sometime in the, in the 1900s. One was uh, Martin Heidegger, who was probably the most famous philosopher of the last century. But another student, and many say his best student, was a woman named Edith Stein, who some of you may have heard of, who uh, eventually left his employment to become St. Teresa Benedicta the Cross. And just a simple story about St. Teresa Benedicta, which her feast day was what, Wednesday? Thursday. Okay, um, she was highly intelligent and she studied a lot. But one of the major things of her conversion was that she was a Jewish girl. And so she, um, as she was studying and things um, about the church, the Catholic church, she just stepped inside of the church one day just to, you know, just to see what was in there maybe. Anyway, what blew her away was a lady came in to make a visit. And Edith just watched her because it was like, obviously this woman came in to talk to someone. That Christ was in that church, and that really had a, a huge impact upon her life. That it was more than just learning, reading books, and obviously that's important, but she encountered, she saw it with her eyes. There is, however, perhaps one uh, personalist philosopher who's more famous, and perhaps uh, at the same level of holiness as uh, Teresa Benedicta, and that's John Paul II, also from the same school of thought. Pope John Paul says, we shall not be saved by a formula, but by a person, Christ himself, who is to be known, loved, and imitated. Um, before he, the last book that he wrote before becoming Pope, Pope is called The Acting Person. So he's trying to express that we need to, to live our faith. It's not just in the mind, it needs to be lived out. And this is, this is the, the flavor of this year of faith, is this relationship with Christ. Another person we all know and love, Pope Benedict, in the beginning of the introduction of his book, this book, Jesus of Nazareth, is my own personal search for the face of the Lord. Now, Pope Benedict, we all know, is brilliant. He's a scholar. I, I mean, I've even read that people are saying he's a genius. But, but here is this man who knows a lot, but he's seeking the face of Christ. He's He's wants this deeper and deeper relationship with a person. Yeah, keep Father Tony Vico with this question at the front of your mind throughout this whole uh, presentation. Imagine him asking the Holy Father, tell me about Jesus, tell me about your personal search for the face of the Lord. Imagine Father Tony asking you, tell me about your search for the face of the Lord. 
Now, we see in the popes that they have this, uh, this very intimate, incarnate, personal relationship with Jesus, but in so many of the disciplines and activities of the church since the council, the same sort of personal relationship uh, infuses all of them. Just take the liturgy, for example. Okay? What is the liturgy? Define the liturgy. Well, it's a set of rubrics and ceremonies, and it's the official worship of the church. That's true. All of those things are true. Ask Pope John Paul II what the liturgy is. As we would come to expect from him, he says, the liturgy offers the deepest and most effective answer to this yearning for the encounter with God. It does so especially in the Eucharist. Okay? It's, uh, uh, it's more than just rubrics. What it is essentially is the personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Can you go back to oh, sure, sorry. Uh, again, it's not we're saying don't teach about the Eucharist. That's completely necessary. But we have to make sure that they are they know they are receiving Jesus. The rosary. John Paul II also says something similar here. To recite the rosary is nothing other than to contemplate with Mary the face of Christ. Now you might recall one of the lasting things from this year of the rosary, which was I don't know, maybe ten years ago now, longer than that actually, uh, is these luminous mysteries, right? Now, before the year of the rosary, we, if you were to pray the rosary, you'd get to the fifth joyful mystery, which was the finding of Jesus in the temple, and then you'd pick up with the first of the sorrowful mysteries, which is the agony in the garden. Now, what would you say is missing if you were to meditate on the life of Christ uh, according to the rosary that way? Almost, his, yeah, everything in his life, from age 12 to the agony in the garden. So with the introduction of these luminous mysteries, the baptism, the wedding feast of Cana, uh, the spreading of the gospel, the transfiguration, the institution of the Eucharist, it really, kind of in a literal sense, fleshes out the luminous, shining, bright, brilliant face of Jesus Christ so that we can come to this encounter with him. Okay? To pray the rosary is to sit at the school of Mary and to learn what Jesus looks like. And all of these aids are meant to help us do this. I said to Anne that uh, sometimes uh, uh, I meditate on the mysteries of Chris's life when I pray the rosary. Because I find I get done praying the rosary 15 minutes later and I've thought nothing about Chris, except Chris Carson's. And the things he has to do and the problems he has. Uh, that's right, it has something to do with Jesus somewhere in here. All of this is meant to foster this encounter with Christ. Okay, again, we're still in the first part of our presentation and it's a personal faith. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't pray the rosary because it's just the same 50 Hail Marys and all this. But it's like, that, that's a part of it, and that's an important part. I know for about the first year when I started praying the rosary as an adult, it was like, I got lost in the words, and that was beautiful. But, the, but a major point to the rosary is to think about those scenes and, and meditate on the scriptures of the life of Christ, which... Then we have these images and we, we come to know what Jesus looked like and, and what he was doing and how he interacted and miracles, etc. It, it's incredible. That's how we encounter him. Uh, the church's treatment of the sacred scriptures is also influenced by this personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, this is from Pope Benedict on the uh, letter he wrote that concluded the year of St. Paul on the sacred scriptures. He says, in Isaiah and in Romans, we read, The Lord made his word short. He abbreviated it. The Son himself is the word, the Logos. The eternal word became small, small enough to fit into a manger so that the word could be grasped by us. It, the substance of the scriptures is the person of Jesus. He continues this quote. He says, The word now not only has a voice, it has a face. The word with a face on it. This is how intimate and personal this is. Uh, another great doctor of the church, a deacon, St. Ephraim, uh, you've heard me mention this before, speaks of this double incarnation that Jesus, that the second person underwent. Not only is the second person of the Blessed Trinity taken on our flesh, but the second person of the Trinity, who is a word, has taken on our words. He's contained in the words of the sacred scripture. He's incarnate in them. So these words that we read, and these words that we hear, boy, they're as, as substantial as any word ever has been or ever could be. Here in the diocese, we promote the use of Lexio Divina, praying with scripture. You don't need to use the Latin term, praying with scripture. Um, why? Because Blessed John Paul and Pope Benedict, in, I'm guessing off the top of my head, at least 10 documents, call us to pray, to rediscover the use of this praying with scripture. We have a simple form you can use. Why? Because 
Not only do, does it help you to think about Jesus' life, but it calls you to put yourself in the scene. You're drawn to relate to one of the persons in the passage, and then the Holy Spirit makes this, makes this connection with you and, and, and your life. Okay, and so it's like, again, here we're encountering the person of Christ. Pope Benedict, in the document, The Door of Faith, that introduces the year of faith, says on page after page of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we find that what is presented here is no theory, but an encounter with the person who lives within the church. So what is the Catechism? It's a biography of Christ. It's the truth about him, and when we pray with those truths, when we study them and contemplate them, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we encounter Christ. I know a DRE about eight years ago said to me, I was talking about the catechism, and I maybe didn't really know what I was talking about, but anyway, <laughs> she said, you know, what, what are you talking about? Nobody's going to use the catechism. It's a reference book. If there's maybe a question once a year, you need to learn something. And it was like, I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't quite know how to defend it. The catechism is beautiful. And reading it from cover to cover a little bit each night, you will encounter Christ on page after page. All right, so the liturgy, the rosary, the scriptures, catechesis, everything else, uh, in the papacies of John Paul II, Benedict XVI, everything after the Second Vatican Council, is centered upon this personal relationship and this encounter with Jesus Christ. So too with evangelization, this new evangelization. But before we get to new evangelization, let's just review what good old-fashioned first-time-around evangelization is. Paul VI says, if you want to know how to evangelize, look to that first and greatest evangelist, Jesus himself. How did he do it? When we look to these gospel accounts, how Jesus evangelized, uh, we see a pattern that, uh, that emerges. And guess what the first step in it is? Encountering the person of Christ. Okay, all these people in the gospel accounts, they begin with this living, personal encounter with Jesus. It leads them to uh, a conversion from sin into Christ. And thirdly, uh, this, this irresistible desire to go out and proclaim the good news, even when, right, there's all these stories where Jesus says, now don't go tell anybody about this, okay? They never listen. They can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. They go out and they tell everyone who will listen what's happened to them. One of uh, uh, the Holy Father's favorite examples is uh, St. Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Okay? He wants to see Jesus, the person of Jesus, but he's short in stature. So he has to rush up ahead on the road and he climbs up a tree. So when Jesus passes by, he can see him. Well, Jesus does pass by. He says, Zacchaeus, I need to stay at your house tonight. And with joy... Joy. Father Tech talked about this yesterday. Joy. He hurries down and he welcomes Jesus into his house, that is, into his heart. He's undergone a conversion. Well, when the townspeople see this, they start grumbling. Doesn't Jesus know who this guy is? He's been cheating people for all these years, collecting our taxes. Zacchaeus hears this and he says, Look, anyone I cheated, I'll pay back fourfold. And I'll give up half of my possessions away to the poor. That's this, this proclaiming the, new, the good news that's resulted. This paradigm exists in many, many places in the gospel, and it can exist for us today. Okay, and so the new evangelization. Evangelization to those countries and cultures where entire groups of the baptized have lost the living sense of the faith, or even no longer consider themselves members of the church, and live a life far removed from Christ and his gospel. They require a new evangelization, or a re-evangelization. Um, at my parish, I was helping with RCIA, and one year we had a young woman from Eastern Europe who, who lives here now, but um, she was married into a family where one of the persons was a priest, the uncle of the man she was married. And anyway, the priest said, oh, well, she lived pretty far from town, and so he said, okay, well, I'll prepare you. And I thought, oh, that's beautiful. I mean, I just kind of heard it on the sideline. Well, anyway, I mean, I, I didn't even ever think any more about it, Lo and behold, right before the right of election, somebody calls me and says, this person needs a skirt to borrow. It's the only reason I, I became involved. They, they, Do you have a skirt she can wear to the right of election? And I'm thinking, who, who is this? What, where are they coming from? So anyway, she, 
she comes to my house, gets the skirt, she tells me a little bit, you know, this priest has been preparing her, just her by herself. And she's saying, that, you know, everything I, I'm hearing is just, is just so good and I'm really learning a lot. Well, so anyway, she comes to the first rite where she's with now a community. I mean, she had been going to another church by herself, I think. Anyway, so she comes to our parish, um, and she goes to the right, and then she asks me if she can ride with me to go to the right of election, right? I'm sitting at the parish in the right of election at the cathedral. And so after the right, she's, she's absolutely overwhelmed by the church and the community and the bishop. And she comes up to me and she's pulling on my arm and she goes, what are you doing right now? And I said, I'm, you know, I had some friends from out of town. I was going to meet out by the mall for dinner. She, I go, well, do you want to come? And she goes, oh, oh, yes, yes. I have to go with you because I, I have to see how Catholics act. <laughs> and it's like, what's the point? It can't, it has to be in the head. But it's also got to be in the heart. You've got to see it. You've got to live it. You've got to encounter Christ. You've got to see it in other people's lives also. See, she's a perfect example of what this means by new evangelization. What people of today need is this reintroduction to the person of Jesus. They want to see Jesus. Uh, John Paul loved this uh, line from the Gospels about the Greeks who came to Philip and said, we want to see Jesus. It's not enough just to tell people about Jesus. Men and women of today, he says, still want to see Jesus. Just like this, this girl, I want to see how Catholics live. I want to see Jesus in these people around me. So it is, under the same paradigm, this reintroduction to the person of Jesus himself. It all begins with this personal encounter of a reconversion and then a recommitment uh, uh, to him and proclaiming the world. Okay, so in light of this core, this personal encounter with Jesus Christ, how will this influence this year of faith that is upon us. We want to look at some of the characteristics of this year of faith that will begin this coming October 11th. Okay, and so we asked the question, what is faith? Why do we start there? Important word, for the year of faith. And isn't faith one of the most misunderstood terms in the whole, in all of our vocabulary? Um, it's not just wishful thinking. It's not superstition. Um, but we, especially us, catechetical leaders and catechists, we need to ask this question and answer it, and ask our catechists to answer it also. Okay, and so what is faith? Faith is both a gift of God and a human act. It's two parts. It's a gift of God and a, res and a human act, a response, by which the believer gives personal adherence to God who invites his response and freely assents to the whole truth that God has revealed. And so what's the point? The act of faith. Faith is between two persons. It's between me, it's between you, and between and God. It's Him revealing and us responding. Yeah, another quality about uh, faith is that uh, what God tells us in this relationship is true. Again, to refer to Father Check, he said last night, he said, you know, I could be lying to you. In fact, I could be lying to you right now. Well, we have something over on God that way. God cannot lie to you. What God tells us is absolutely true. It's not in his nature. It's impossible for him to lie. Okay? He cannot deceive. And we hear this in the uh, act of faith, the prayer that uh, uh, I'm going to try to pray every day during the year of faith. I'm going to try to teach it to my kids during this year of faith. And I wonder if it would be worthwhile for all of us to learn this during the year of faith. Why don't we say this act of faith together now? Oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that you are divine Son. not because they have to make the greatest amount of sense to us, not that they're illogical, but they're in many ways beyond our comprehension to, uh, to understand. We believe them because God has told us that he cannot deceive us. Okay, and so in light of the year of faith, what is the characteristic about faith? <clears throat> well, 
To obey, from the Latin audire, to hear or listen to in faith, is to submit freely to the word that has been heard, because its truth is guaranteed by God, who is truth itself. Abraham is the model of such obedience offered us by sacred scripture. The Virgin Mary is its most perfect embodiment. So I just find it very interesting. I've never thought about this before. But to obey means to listen first. To listen and receive and then respond. And so we have the model, Abraham. Look, let's take a little look at his life. I mean, God calls him to leave this land. He doesn't know where he's going. He's going to walk. And he walks 1,200 miles, and then when he gets there, that's when God says, you're here now, okay? Then his wife is very old, what, what is she, 88, whatever. Uh, your wife's going to have a son, okay? And then when he's 12 or whatever, 16, you're going to sacrifice your son. So even though all of it seemed totally irrational, he listened to God, and he said yes. And then, of course, we have Mary, the perfect embodiment who you're going to conceive by the Holy Spirit. You're going to have this son, the son of God. And she said yes. And if you read any like Wednesday audiences or other little speeches that, that the Holy Father gives, he's always talking about the yes. You can summarize our faith in one word, yes. It's all about the yes to God. All right, so we've said those things kind of by way of introduction. We want to uh, look now more closely at three characteristics that we think uh, uh, will exist during this year of faith and that Pope Benedict is leading us to in light of everything we've said thus far. First of all, that faith is not only an objective faith. It is that. Don't misunderstand us. It is that, but it's also a personal faith. Second, it's not only a true faith. It is very true. Ain't nothing ever been truer. But it's also a beautiful faith. And then thirdly, it's not only a faith that exists in the mind, in the head, in the intellect, but one that exists also in the heart. All right, so let's look at these three things in a little bit more detail. First of all, that uh, faith is personal. Uh, this is uh, from this uh, uh, kind of instructions that followed uh, Pope Benedict's letter announcing the year of faith, and it says this, This year of faith will be a propitious occasion for the faithful to understand more profoundly that the foundation of Christian faith is the encounter with an event, a person. Ever heard that before? The encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and decisive direction. This internal quote is from Deus Caritas, S from Pope Benedict. Faith begins with this personal encounter. Now, the best explanation I've heard of this comes from uh, Father Bear, and uh, I know some of you have seen his Catholicism stuff. He has a great website. He has these little video commentaries under everything under the sun. Well, right after uh, Pope Benedict announced this year of faith, he came on and explained this very thing. And he gave this analogy about this personal faith. He said, if you just start on the human plane, let's say you want to get to know someone. Okay? You see the girl across campus. You think, no, I want to get to know her. So you observe her. You ask her friends about her. Okay? You can uh, look her up on Facebook or Google or whatever. You can learn all sorts of things by just empirical evidence, just by watching. But you can only learn so much. Eventually, you're going to want to be introduced. And after you are, if your relationship blossoms, she's going to open up the secrets of her heart to you. Things that are not verifiable by anything you can see. She's going to tell you things about herself that only she knows. And at that point, it's up to you to say, I believe her. Or I don't. This is the same sort of thing that's happening with our relationship with God. Stealing everything from Father Chuck, he said last night, our desire is uh, to know and be known, to love and be loved in an intimate and personal way. This can happen uh, in, in the most beautiful way in our faith relationship with God. We can know all sorts of things about God just by observation. Okay? Uh, uh, Father Barrett calls them Thomas Aquinas the Sherlock Holmes of theology. Because he observes all of these things and he can come to a great knowledge about God. But that only takes us so far. Eventually, if God wants us to know him, he needs to open up the secrets of his own heart, his innermost being to us. That is the revelation. And it's up to us then to say, yes, I believe that. Or no, I don't. This is the intimate personal faith. It's not simply an assent to number 264 of the Catechism. Right? 
It's a very incarnate, personal relationship. Uh, the second thing, the second characteristic, is that uh, the faith is uh, not only true, but it is beautiful. Faith is a beautiful thing. Uh, St. Augustine, you know, if you've ever read anything by St. Augustine, it's probably maybe his confessions, okay? And in the very opening paragraph, he has that famous line about, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. He's searching for the beauty of God. As Pope Benedict says, St. Augustine's life was a continual search for the beauty of faith until such times his heart would find rest in God. Now, beauty is very closely associated with truth. Uh, the philosophers, Pope uh, John Paul called beauty the splendor of truth. It's that which radiates out from the truth. It's that which makes the truth beautiful and desirable. Uh, a friend of ours gives this analogy. When you're a kid, you got home, you open the front door, and you smell chocolate chip cookies. Okay? The truth of the matter is, mom has made something in the kitchen, and it's radiating out its beauty into the entryway of the house. And what are you going to do? It's going to suck you in. It's going to attract you into that truth. That's what beauty does. Or think of the transfiguration. The true Son of God finally reveals, he's transfigured and his glory shines out in a beautiful way. And what does Peter say? Oh, we've got to do something. Uh, let's, uh, quick, let's build some booths or huts or something. We can't just stand here. It impels us to act. Or those of you who uh, say you've, uh, uh, your church has undergone some sort of building project. You know, Father and the committee, they lay out the blueprints, the plans, and that, that raises a little bit of money, but when they see it come to life, ooh, that's when people get inspired and the project comes to completion. Okay? So the faith that we have is not only true, but it's also beautiful. Okay, and so the beauty, splendor of truth. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is a text promulgated by my predecessor, Blessed John Paul II, with a view to illustrating for all the faithful the power and beauty of the faith. So the word illustrating, the luster shining out of the truth from the catechism, which is now at its 20th anniversary. Okay, so we see the beauty of the truth in this incredibly important book, probably the most important book after the Bible. Okay, and so where? how do we see this beauty? What do you mean? Um, Okay, well, let's, let's take the truest of all things that we know and believe, the crucifixion. How is the crucifixion beautiful? Yes, of course, it's, it's bloody and it's terrible and awful. And if you've pondered on it, you know that. If you've seen the passion, you know that. But why is it beautiful? Because it's the truth of the Son of God giving his life for us, dying for our sins and opening the gates of heaven. Him completely giving himself totally out of love for us. That's the beauty of the truth. And those who follow the truth of Jesus are also beautiful. Pope Benedict says, By faith across the centuries, men and women of all ages have confessed the beauty of following the Lord Jesus. Not just the truth of following the Lord, but how beautiful it is to do so. Wherever they are called to bear witness to the fact that they were Christians family, in the workplace, in public life, and the exercise of the charisms and ministries to which they were called. You know, I encourage you before to find out more about Blessed Chiara Luce Badano. Uh, you'll see this picture of her lying on her deathbed. You know, again, a ball. This beautiful smile. She's the most beautiful woman in all of Italy. Why is Teresa of Calcutta more beautiful than any supermodel that's around? Why is Miguel Augustine Pro saying mass in squalor and clandestinely with people packed in a room for fear of death and persecution? Why is that a beautiful mass? Just like the crucifixion of Jesus, it's beautiful because it's the clearest radiation of the truth itself. That's what our faith is. So it's not just true and what we need to recognize and help others to recognize, it's also Okay, and so the first characteristic was it's a personal faith, the second one that it's beautiful, and now the third is it's a faith taken to heart. You have received the creed and recited it, but in your minds and hearts you must keep it ever present. You must repeat it in your beds, recall it in the public squares, and not forget it during meals. Even when your body is asleep, you must watch over it with your hearts. And so how do we take it? We have to learn it. 
But how do we take our faith from our head to our heart? That is through prayer. Um, you know, a saint doesn't become a saint because they know a lot. I'm sure we all know people that didn't have very much education, but we could probably say they're saints. It's because they prayed a great deal. And in prayer, what they did know went from their head to their heart. They encountered Christ and fell in love with Him. They knew Him, they loved Him, and they served Him. You might recall, if you, if you attended any of the Roman Missal uh, sessions, we dissected that word credo, and some suggest that it's a contraction of two, which is, we, I believe, uh, a contraction of two words, core, which means heart, you're cordially invited, or you have cor coronary bypass surgeries, means your heart. And do means like indoning, to give. So to say, I believe, or credo, means I give over my heart. It's not just an intellectual thing. Yeah, I agree with all those things you've just said. I'm putting my very heart on the line. Uh, Pope Benedict mentions uh, this woman, uh, uh, Lydia, in, uh, that occurs in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Paul goes to Philippi, and he goes to preach and uh, as uh, the Holy Father uh, recounts for us, uh, the teaching is that uh, knowing the content to be believed is not sufficient. And knowing the content to believe is not sufficient. I hear Father Tony Vigo asking me that question. Tell me about Jesus. I know the content of the faith, but that is not sufficient. Uh, unless the heart, the authentic sacred space within the person is opened by grace that allows the eyes to see below the surface and to understand these are the, another word for substantial, that which stands underneath. The true substance of the faith isn't accessible entirely by the mind, but by the heart itself. All right, so in summary, three things we want you to uh, kind of keep at the forefront of your mind as we celebrate this year of faith. That faith is not only objective, it also needs to be personal. Okay? It's a relationship between you and Jesus Christ in the body of the church. Second of all, it's not only true, but it's beautiful. You know, what, what wonders how the best way to evangelize, is it through proclaiming the truth of the faith or how beautiful it is? What is more convincing to people today? Thirdly, that it's not only a faith that lives in the head, but it's a faith that abides in the heart as well. Okay, Chris, can you come back? I just want to, um, I don't know, maybe you don't struggle with this, but I can remember for a while I struggled with what is objective? You know, you've got objective and subjective. Um, the faith is objective, okay? It's not subjective. I don't decide what, what I should believe. God has revealed it to us. We have a set of truths. They've been put together in the catechism, okay? Objective truth. It's not this whole mentality we face today is you believe what you believe and I believe what I believe and don't impose your beliefs on me. That's subjective. This is objective truth that we're speaking about. So this is the whole package of what faith needs to be. Okay, so we come to the third part of our presentation here. Uh, this personal faith that has these characteristics just outlined. And what this means for the new evangelization. And one of the places we want to look at are at some of the, what Pope Benedict calls the signs of the times. We need to be very aware of what the signs of the times are. So even though it's a little bit of a downer section of the presentation, it's important that uh, we're familiar with these, even though you are familiar with them without them having to be up here. Go ahead. Andy. Okay, so these are the obstacles for, that come against us for the faith growing. Whereas in the past it was possible to recognize a unitary cultural matrix broadly accepted in its appeal to the content of the faith and the values inspired by it. Today, this is no longer, this no longer seems to be the case in large swaths of society because of profound crisis of faith that has affected many people. What's, what's Pope Benedict saying? But our culture is no longer Christian. And so people, they don't see models out there. there, there there's no evidence of the Christian faith out in, in the culture. Cultural Catholicism <laughs> it isn't going to last long in this culture. Uh, whatever Catholicism there is, it's going to be very deliberate uh, and very lively. Uh, second, to a greater extent than in the past, faith is now being subjected to a series of questions arising from a changed mentality which, especially today, limits the field of rational certainties to that of scientific and technological discoveries. We hit upon this in the first uh, uh, session this morning. You know, we only hold, or too many people only hold what is true if it can be proven scientifically or technologically. 
Okay, the next obstacle we face is relativism. That is letting oneself be tossed here and there, carried about by every wind of doctrine, seems the only attitude that can, that can cope with modern times. We are building a dictatorship of relativism that does not recognize anything as definitive and whose ultimate goal consists solely of one's own ego and desires. Pope Benedict used that this was spoken right before he was proclaimed Pope, right? Yes. And so his, his famous words, dictator, dictatorship of relativism. Okay, this goes back to what I just spoke briefly about the objective truths. He's saying in our culture, people say, well, I'm the arbiter of truth. I decide what is true. If I don't believe that, well, that's, that's just tough. You believe what you want to believe, I believe what I want to believe. He's saying, he's calling that, that's a dictatorship of relativism. No, we have objective truth revealed to us by God. And for a lot of another obstacle that we face is just the image that the church has for many people. That the church is not a means to encountering Jesus Christ, but an obstacle for too many for encountering Jesus Christ. He wrote this in 1995. This characteristic of the situation of faith and theology today, that people are weary of the church. The alternative, Jesus, yes, the church, no, seems to be typical for the thinking of an entire generation. Uh, some of you might recall April of this very year is the cover of Newsweek. It's a picture of Jesus standing in uh, Times Square. And the headline was, uh, Forget the Church, Follow Jesus. Okay? I'd say he's nailed this. Or even uh, earlier this year, there was uh, this video that was uh, going around YouTube, uh, Why I Love Jesus But Hate Religion. Remember that one? It, the same sort of thing. That the church isn't seen as an aid, in fact, a necessary means for coming to Jesus Christ, but for too many people it's seen as the obstacle, it's optional for coming to Jesus Christ. One great problem facing the church today is the lack of knowledge of the faith, religious illiteracy. With such illiteracy, we cannot grow. Therefore, we must reappropriate the contents of the faith, not as a packet of dogmas and commandments, but as a unique reality revealed in all its in, in its and all its profoundness and beauty. Wait. Um, in other words, it can't just be these facts that we're spouting out. It's much more than that. The dogmas are the, the teachings, the doctrines are about a person. We need to teach them, but we need to help the people, the students, to encounter Christ in those truths about him. We must do everything possible for catechetical renewal in order for the faith to be known, God to be known, Christ to be known, the truth to be known, and for unity in the truth to grow. You know, our first draft of this had more of these, we're going to hell in a handbasket sort of slides in them. We took some of them out and thought it might be uh, too much. We know what we're up against. Um, but we should know at the same time that there's a great opportunity for evangelization, perhaps now more than there was even at the time of the Second Vatican Council. Some of you have heard of Romano Gardini, who was a famous uh, theologian of the last century. And in uh, 1964, right in the middle of the council, he wrote this uh, famous letter, famous among literature types like me. Uh, and he asked the question, if the modern person is even capable of participating in the liturgical ritual act, because modernism was so against everything uh, that the church was doing. Well, Father Barron uh, wrote a letter, uh, kind of in, in light of this, sometime after, he suggests that today we're in a better position than the people of the world were in 1964. He says, at the end of the bloodiest century on record, we are, to say the least, skeptical about the gloriously autonomous subject. In other words, 50 years ago, we were skeptical about everything except ourselves. Today, we're skeptical about being skeptical. Okay? We've tried to do the best we can on our own powers. We give it the old Boy Scout try, and it hasn't turned out to be that great of a century, the bloodiest century on record. Maybe we're not the ground of all reality. Simply in light of this postmodern awareness and the dire practical consequences of autonomous subjectivity, we are more capable of the liturgical act, more ready to engage in the great practice of the God-centered self. Um, you know, 
just uh, an unfortunate look at news events from just this year shows where our own powers have gotten us. You know, weekly shootings, uh, there's stories of cannibalism in, the, in, in, in Western culture. This is the point where we are. This is where we've gotten ourselves. We need something else. There has to be something that will get us out of this. And that is uh, this God-centered life. Pope Benedict says, the people of today can still experience the need to go to the well, like the Samaritan woman, in order to hear Jesus, who invites us to believe in him and to draw upon the source of living water welling up within him. Indeed, the teaching of Jesus still resounds in our day with the same power. So what is he saying? That we still have a place to go to find the truth, to encounter Jesus in the church. I just want to share two brief things about recently we had a, a Hmong retreat for Hmong Catholics in La Crosse and Wausau. And 75 Hmong came to the shrine for an all-day retreat. And it was just so beautiful for, to, to watch them come to this incredibly beautiful place and, and be, you know, very, very simple in their faith. They haven't been in our country that long. They don't speak our language that well. And so we're, 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 we're attempting to teach them, but it's very, very slow. Anyway, they, they walk into the shrine and they all fall on their knees and they begin praying and just have an incredible encounter with Christ there. Another situation recently, um, in 10 years of my work at the diocese, I've never had anyone email me about RCIA. And, a, and a, about a month ago, in two weeks, I had three people out of the clear blue. And one person, she emailed me and she said, um, I don't quite know who to go. And she didn't tell me how she got my name. But anyway, she said, um, you know what? I, I've tried everything. I have a great job. I just quit. I'm coming to La Crosse to go back to school to get a degree in religious studies or servant leadership or something like that. And she said, um, I really don't know anything. So before I start this program, master's program, can I just talk to you a little bit? And so anyway, I, I emailed her back and I said, okay, I'll meet you for dinner. Well, we had the most incredible time and she just said, you know, we were that, we were, we were that family of priesters. We went on Christmas and Easter and she said, um, you kind of when we would ask questions and we would, would want to maybe do things that we'd heard were Catholic, our parents would kind of like knock us down. No, 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 no. We just go to church a couple times a year and we're good. And she said, so I really don't know anything. And so we just talked and talked and, and it's like she said, there's something missing in my life and I'm not going to stop until I find it. I bring that up because I believe in this year of faith, the Lord is going to shower us with graces. And you, we, we're going to be having people out of the blue coming to us. And so we must be ready in our own lives through a life of prayer and study. And they want to come to Jesus through the church. Profession of faith is an act both personal and communitarian. I believe is the faith of the church professed personally by each believer. So we come to this personal encounter with Jesus Christ, but we don't do so uh, as uh, living cells in the church itself. We can't escape our social nature. Uh, Aristotle, some uh, 2,500 years ago, says, man by nature is a political, social animal. Cannot get away from it. Um, the Wall Street Journal earlier this year had an excerpt from a book called Religion for Atheists. And the uh, article uh, was going something like, uh, as religion starts to, uh, starts to decline, it's practice in Western cultures, what goes along with it is this, uh, this ability to socialize. And we become so fractured and individuals, individualistic. And so this author is saying, can we come up with some sort of religion for atheists that will allow us still the social cohesion that we want to have? Okay? And so uh, the church will be the place, it needs to be the place where people, where people will come to encounter Christ with others. What the world is in particular need to, of today is the credible witness of people enlightened in mind and heart by the word of the Lord, and capable of opening the hearts and minds of many to the desire for God and for true life, life without end. Okay, and so will you insert your picture there? Will I insert my picture there? Will we be the ones that radiate this truth and beauty and personal relationship of Christ for others?
through a life of study and prayer. So, when someone asks you, and someone will, uh, continue to ask me, tell me about Jesus. Will we have a good answer for them about the person of Jesus alive in us and alive in the church today? This is our occasion to really make this uh, our faith very incarnate, uh, very, very, very important.